Hello, you're listening to the New Daughters of Africa podcast, an interview series with contributors to Margaret Busby's landmark international anthology of women writers of African descent. My name is Panashe Chigumadzi, and one of the absolute gifts and joys both the first and the second Daughters of Africa anthology is the ways in which it gathers writers from across geography, generation, and language. As an Anglophone African writer, I'm acutely aware of the ways in which we as Anglophone writers are overrepresented in the canon of what we call and what we understand as African literature. I'm aware that different um, or particular versions of Blackness in African American, maybe sometimes even South African versions of Blackness are the overrepresented versions of what we understand to be Blackness. I'm really excited to speak today to Jamila Pereira de Almeida, who is a Lusophone writer who was born in Angola in 1982 and grew up in Portugal and now lives in the suburbs of Lisbon. It's really exciting to meet a writer who has such an expansive body of work across genres, exploring all these different topics around the question of identity and individuality, but very much grounded in the question of history, time, and place. Jamila, thank you so much for taking time to meet with us today. I can't wait for everyone to hear your work. It's really fantastic to see the ways in which you've worked with form and the way in which you work with sometimes subjects that can sometimes seem overwrought or become cliche when we talk about black womanhood, such as hair, for example. But the ways in which you explore it, I've never quite seen something done in the ways that you have. So I'm really excited for our listeners to get to hear that, and particularly for Anglophone readers who don't really read across um, language. Like myself, we don't have the pleasure of getting to read works like yours. I'm really excited to have that introduction to your work. For those of you who don't already know Jamila, she's the author of two novels, Ese Cabello, which was published in 2015, um, which was the winner of the Novos Prize in 2016 and the finalist of the Casina de Povoa Prize in 2018, as well as Luanda Lisboa Paracio, which was published in 2018. Her portrait of a community of people with cerebral palsy, Ajuda Akur, Helping to Fall, was published in 2017. She's a graduate of the New University of Lisbon, where she obtained a PhD in literary theory. In 2013, she received the Serrata Essay Prize, and in 2016, she was a finalist of the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Arts Initiative. She's a contributor to a wide range of platforms, such as the blog Compañia das Letras in Brazil, and her writing has appeared in Granta, Granta Portugal, Revista Serrata, Revista Zoom, Quatro Cinco Um, Revista Pessoa, Ler and Words Without Borders, and 2020, Ese Cabello, was published in translation as That Hair in the U.S. And I think one of the first things that I'm most interested in is the question of form. Essay, philosophy, um, you're thinking about autofiction, all these different kinds of things come together in the writing that you do. And sometimes you're thinking, well, is this Jai Media? And should I be thinking that in the first place? Um, you know, is this the narrative? And you're moving through all these different ways of thinking and presenting narrative. What does that mean for you to work through form as something that seems to be just as, if not even more important than the actual message itself? I think something I think a lot about when I'm writing the book to think about the book I want to write, and also, at the same time, the question of what will make this book a book. I'm interested in this question not only specifically in when I'm doing a particular project, but in general. What is a book? What can make a book work? And what can make a book um, feel right? And the way I look at this is, and the Escabel is a, is an example of that. I think of novels as the most liberating form of all. So for me, it's a form that, um, conducts liberty insofar as it is open to every other form. So I try to always look to novels in a way that preserves a room for surprise Mm -hmm. uh, as I am doing them. 
so many times I arrive at a point where from chapter to chapter, uh, the book is changing in front mm -hmm. of me and in front of the reader. So because uh, the book is open to many kinds of writing, many genres, uh, many kinds of discourse. And so I think this pervades all of my novels have this openness. I find that really fascinating because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it can sometimes feel that, you know, hair, for example, becomes a hackneyed subject for black women to speak about. And I wonder if in the reception to this book, there has been an appreciation of its form that it mm -hmm. hasn't been or the reception hasn't been overdetermined by the subject matter. Have people been able to appreciate the actual literary merit and i think it's it's beyond even here as a subject matter i think very often for black artists um provided we mine into questions of self and identity there begins to be a shift in focus to the subject matter and forget the actual craft that we put into it and that we, we develop um so do you find that there was that appreciation of what you did and really the miracle that you've been able to create in terms of form yeah, the supposed issue you mm -hmm. are working on always takes the front. Uh, here in Portugal is the same, especially if you are, surely if you are a black artist uh, in general. But in the case of uh, Iscabelo, I, I didn't suffer uh, from that, to be honest, because the critics and the readers, people enjoyed particularly the form of the book. That it wasn't just a book mm -hmm. about something they weren't exactly used to read about in Portuguese, but also that it was a book written in a way that was curious for mm -hmm. the specific subject matter it had. I think the book benefit, uh, and me as an author benefit from that novelty, so to mm -hmm. speak. It was not exactly a novelty, but it was a non unexpected way of treating uh, something that people wouldn't, I don't know, maybe they were expecting another kind of book, another kind of writing. Yeah, I completely love that. And again, just thinking about the novel, and I think it had a very improvisatory element to it. So you're working mm -hmm. with listening to and being humble to what the story needs. As, mm -hmm. as it goes along. And one of the things I thought was really fascinating is the ways in which the book is very much contemporary, but it's also anchored in history. Really, it's the management of time where past, present, and future tense is, okay, now I'm with Mila's grandfather, now I'm with Mila. You know, I found that really interesting to see how time in all the different states of time are constantly bleeding between each other. What was your thinking around that? Yeah, I think that particular kind of fluidity or elusiveness or something has to do with inexperience, really. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it was my first book. I was just experimenting a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was just having fun while yeah. doing it. I didn't know where I would get with uh, what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was discovering as I was writing. Mm -hmm. It's almost like some kind of purity that I find useful and uh, good to preserve, even for a mature writer. This kind of, what I call purities, uh, is to never let your experience make you think you have the whole book figured out before mm -hmm. you do the book. So I was writing the book and I was discovering the as mm -hmm. I was writing the book. So uh, my thinking would go in circles, would go from the past to present to future. I was experimenting. Also, what is curious is that if it was completely spontaneous, if it wasn't calculated, I abstracted from this uh, spontaneity, I abstracted a kind of method of work for future words. And now what I do and what I have done in my novels today is in a way to keep doing this kind of spontaneous, of adventurous uh, mm -hmm. writing. I, I like that a lot. And in the most recent books, this has uh, acquired different forms. I don't go back and forth so, so often, but I use other elements in the in the narrative 
I don't know. I have books where I re, I use sound clips. I use, uh, many voices. I use different elements that my books have, uh, frequently letters and, uh, mm-hmm. notes and, uh, all sorts of elements. The idea is to never think you, you got the process, uh, figured out before you, uh, finish. And that's the beauty of it for me. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And I really love what you said, uh, the idea that a conductor of liberty yeah. and given that just writing and exploring topics that are very much seared by questions of unfreedom and hurt, you know, that hackneyed term oppression. Um, it's really interesting to see how you're using form as a way to explore freedom or to, to rest a freedom from outside of unfreedom. I think that's really fantastic to, to see that. And particularly in, in black women's writing. Um, some of my favorite works by the likes of, you know, Tony Cade Bambara or your Tony Morrison is the way in which they really bend form and genre. And in and of itself, the form communicates more than the subject might, might do. So I thought that was really fantastic. I'm interested in asking you really where do many of these questions or the question of freedom and unfreedom, how does that figure in your life? Mm-hmm. Journalists always ask me uh, and many black authors about things like, have you been uh, a victim of racism or have you been, uh, you've been discriminated or things like that? I always evade that kind of question because um, I feel that to ask a black person if she ever was discriminated is the same thing as ask her if she uh, have noticed that she has an arm or she has a leg. Uh, yes. <laughs> so the answer is so absolutely obvious that I tend to think of that kind of question uh, as something indelicate and also some kind of a lazy question. And to return to something you said before, I always try to force the conversation to go into the books and into uh, the work of writing. The question you asked me was not that question. Uh, you asked me how I, how do I live freedom in my life? What I think is that I have reached a point in writing in my daily life, in my routine of life, that really I can't separate my writing from my experience of freedom. As a citizen, as a person, as a living and thinking woman, my freedom is inseparable from the ways I articulate that freedom in writing. I feel absolutely free. And I feel absolutely free because I feel absolutely free as a writer. I feel this irrespectively of the political situation, of the global political situation to to persons of my color and uh, to the whole pandemic and to to everything. I feel, for me, my books is the place where I am free. I am free to say what I want. So I articulate my freedom through my books and through my writing. So they are a place of freedom to me. They are um, a very precious place and a very safe place. Today we have this expression, safe places. Mm -hmm. I don't like much that expression because I find some some good in discomfort. I would like that my books weren't uh, exactly safe for anyone. So I don't mean by a safe place, a precious place of freedom in books, uh, a place that isn't discomfort and even to me. So sometimes this freedom is very discomfort. I think that's really important in thinking about how do we enact the practice of freedom and finding our work and our craft as a way of enacting that freedom. How did you arrive at writing as your practice of freedom? 
so I have always been interested in, in writing and in literature in some way uh, ever since I was a child. The story is curious because for many years I went to the university to study literature with um, the desire to become a writer someday. I stayed in university for more than 10 years in um, PhD and uh, many things. And during that time, I completely forgot my desire, my, my aspiration, my, my dream. Uh, so I forgot that in the midst of paper writing and uh, articles, essays and things like that, so it was just in, in the end when I finished my PhD and I left the university. At some point, I, I was getting in my 30s and I was just starting to feel a very intense homesickness. I was starting to feel homesick of Africa for the first time in my life. I have lived in Portugal for my whole life since I was a baby. I started to feel a very, very, very intense homesickness. It was not just a homesickness, it was some kind of calling. And this experience made me surround myself with all the things I could get my hands on from Africa. And as soon as this uh, longing be uh, began, I started writing. I have long forgotten my desire to write. I wasn't good at it at all after all those years. So I started to listen to that music, to the music my mother used to listen to when she was young, to the music my grandfather used to listen. I started to remember his stories. And all those memories started to, they, they just called for me and I started to write. And that was a moment where I remembered that desire, that first desire. And after that, I started, I wrote that hair and uh, I never stopped ever since. I have written uh, seven other books. So it became my life and I totally for forgot the university. Yeah. And also the, the process of writing all these novels have been the process of trying to forget everything I learned at university. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah. So I, I think I'm almost done. Uh, forgetting so it has been a long process you're yeah, done forgetting, forgetting. <laughs> yes i'm done forgetting and i i'm i'm doing a good job because i don't remember almost anything i have studied. yeah i have studied yeah i think that's quite interesting well, one i i absolutely love that it was going back to music and i wonder what kind of songs were you listening to can you give us a playlist were you listening to that you know yeah. brought you back home yeah i was listening mostly to Angolan music from the 70s, maybe artists like Bonga, which is very famous. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a, a, an absolutely masterpiece called Angola 1972. Mm -hmm. I was listening to many other very small bands who were around bonga and this movement it's a kind of music uh, that is called semba i was listening to franco i was also listening to music from mali but mostly music uh old music music mm -hmm. from the 70s the 60s so uh, even before you were born yeah music mm -hmm. that uh my mother uh used to listen to when she was a teenager and music from the time uh uh, liberation movements in mm -hmm, Africa. Mm -hmm. And that music just reconnect me with myself. Not only with myself, but with uh, where I, I had came from. Because I think I had forgotten that. Somewhere in the process I forgot mm -hmm. who I was. And the music helped me to remember that. And it's, you know, the book is quite a multi-sensory book yeah. um, you talk a lot about sound you're also talking a lot about smell all these different ways in which memory comes to us it's not just you know in a document or you know a history book it's a very sort of and it's textures all of these different ways in which memory is is happening how are you thinking about those kind of questions yeah many many critics have said that about my books about all the smells and sounds and uh and scents and uh, mm -hmm. all of that because I, I don't know, but I think memory and memory is certainly very important in that hair. Memory is, um, is multiple. It mm -hmm. has many dimensions, mm -hmm. but I think in particular in that hair, 
all those elements were the things that I need to recreate that time in my mind. I had lost uh, a parent um, some months ago, and um, at some point in the process of grief and of um, pain and suffering, I had I felt the need to buy the perfume which my mother used to wear when she was around the age I am now. And I started to wear the perfume. The perfume helped me uh, reconnect with mm -hmm. good times in my mm -hmm. life, with mm -hmm. good memories. When I was younger and my mother was younger and mm -hmm. everyone was kind of happy and not afraid of death and not afraid of mm -hmm. dying. And all, all of us were very far from all of this pandemic, um, situation. So in that it hair, that's the, those perfumes, uh, all those scents and smells and all those flavors appear in the book because, uh, I needed them as mm -hmm. I need this perfume from my mother mm -hmm. recently. I needed that to get my mind around a time which is irretrievably mm -hmm. lost. It's a kind of key to have access to a door. And I know that no one is waiting behind the door. And I know that what used to be in the other side of the door is lost. A smell can be a kind of key to mm -hmm. open, to try to reach uh, something. Yeah. I think it's really interesting how your work really demonstrates how memory, although you've mentioned it as irretrievable, is never really lost. Um, it's if we go to the places to find it or the unexpected place to find it, it will be there. It might be a smell, it might be a touch, um, it might be a song that can bring this memory back to us. And I find it really interesting that you say that in order to come back to yourself, to come back to this memory, you had to do a lot of forgetting. What do you think specifically about the academy learning literary theory? So you're studying literature, but you had to forget what you studied in order to go back to literature. What's happening there? Yeah, I really, I have done, and this was not spontaneous. It's an effort. I needed to forget what I have learned in the university while studying literature in order to be free. That forgetting is indeed a way of trying to learn to be free. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, when I started to write, and when I started that hair, what was difficult to me, I didn't know what to do with so much freedom. I had an opportunity, blank page in front of me, where I could do anything. I don't have teachers, I don't have masters, I don't mm -hmm. have anything. It's just mm -hmm. do it, do what you want. I just couldn't stand all that freedom. I have to learn my way through that freedom. And in order to do that, I had to forget all the stuff I had learned. And I, I have been trying to forget, forget the names, forget the dates, forget the names of the books, uh, forget all that theory. It's very comical, in, in fact, because as Freud would put it, uh, some of the repressed things just come, uh, surface now and then. Some of the things I try to forget appear in the books and appear in my life when I'm, I'm not aware. I had to learn to be free. I think that uh, freedom is a very tough lesson. It's a long process which takes an entire life in order for you to be fully free. And it's harder for a woman. I think that men took many of these things for granted. But as a woman, being told from a very young age what to do, what to wear, what to say, what to think, uh, it's harder for you to become a, a free human being. And carving this freedom, having your readers and your critics come along with you on this journey, where do you find in terms of your practice? What are the things that you keep returning to or what are the things that you now find? This is the space that I'm now in. 
And I find it quite interesting that you'd say that, oh, what you were doing in terms of uh, moving through time was the result of inexperience. And now you're a lot more considered. And I thought, well, I thought that was the result of genius as opposed to the result of, <laughs> of inexperience. But what are the things now in your practice as you've been going along on this journey of carving and practicing freedom? Where are you in your practice of freedom and in your writing? So as you think about your next project, what are the kind of things that you find yourself drawn to? I don't know. I have done, I, I am doing the, a trilogy. I have done two and now I'm doing the third uh, novellas. I am very fond of the novella, the, the, the short novel. In Portugal, we don't have a big tradition of novellas. I like the idea of doing a short novel. It has been fun for me to create some kind of restrictions in terms of form to the work I'm doing. I like to put these kind of challenges to myself. Uh, I have done short books. Luanda Lisboa Paraíso, about 250 pages, but most of my novels are short books. And uh, I think that is because I like to, as a reader, I like short books. I have always been a reader of short books. I find it very difficult to do a good short book and to have the nerve to put it out. I am trying to master the short novel. And also, I found it very exciting to do hybrid books. I like the the crossing of genres. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for in, in the books I read is the same thing I'm looking for in a person. I like a person which I can totally uh, predict. In, unpredictable people mm -hmm. is my kind of people. <laughs> uh, I like unpredictable books. And that's you in terms of thinking about form and genre. I was quite interested in how you mentioned that with your PhD um, which I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about was around moral identity. And you've since moved on to other topics. We'll start with telling us a little bit about the PhD, then take us through the evolution of your thinking around various different topics until today. I think that my PhD, despite all the forgetting process, <laughs> I think the yes. PhD is something that runs deeply inside you. The, the idea of my PhD was to do an essay on, it was a meditation or a reflection on the ways people are or aren't inseparable from their own life. So the kind of question I was uh, thinking about was things like, is it possible that we live our lives in a continuous flow between the past and the present? Mm -hmm. How does our self changes in the process? Mm -hmm. Does my seven-year-old self in some way relate to my 39-year-old mm -hmm. self? How is this continuity? Is it a continuity? Uh, so the questions were this. These questions uh, are present in my books. They impregnate my vision of what a character is. So when I think about a character and when I'm writing about some kind of character, I tend to ask the character those types of questions. Mm -hmm. I tend to look at her past. I tend to think of her as in some way part of uh, a continuous relation right. with uh, its other self across time, mm -hmm. even if uh, those uh, other selves are not present in the book I'm writing. Probably because my PhD was very... I invested my feelings in my PhD. Mm -hmm. you see, sometimes people imagine that in academia you are doing uh, something that is very impersonal mm -hmm. and that you are very objective. And certainly I was, but at the same time I was deeply implicated by mm -hmm. my academic work. What I think is that you can forget names and dates and titles and uh, stuff like that. But uh, you can't forget and you can't erase, and I certainly wouldn't like to erase, the way reading some books and thinking about some subjects and some themes changed you. 
you can't erase that. One thing is to forget the book I read yesterday. The mm -hmm. other thing is to forget the way that book changed you. Right. So you uh, transport that transformation with you. That because the book has become you. Right. So in a way, what I am today, I owe to all mm -hmm. those books, right. all of those, and all that teaching. So it's it's within me. And I think that uh, I almost look at this uh, as a kind of legacy mm -hmm. that I have kept from the, those years at university. I think it's, again, I keep saying I think this is wonderful and that's wonderful because I do. It's a genuine <laughs> feeling. But the sense that as you are going through this meditation on the self and we know the Cartesian tradition, the idea that I think, therefore, I am and this idea of objectiveness and disembodied objectiveness mm -hmm. the way you insert an embodiedness that the i and the self does not exist as an island but rather is always deeply connected to time and space deeply connected to generations and to history and embodied feelings is that something you think about very deliberately as you're going through your work? Mm -hmm. As you, as you're saying in your work and in your um, PhD, you didn't try to run away from feeling, even mm -hmm. as you were doing philosophical work that's often see, um, are made to be the opposite or the dichotomy of feeling and embodiment. Certainly my books believe in a way in the kind of embodiment that you are talking about. I certainly learned in university studying personal identity that you are not an island. I certainly learned that. And I learned it. I don't, I didn't learn it as you can learn some slogan. No, I learned it with my blood, with my brain and with my blood and with my soul. So I don't believe we are islands. And in a way, the novel, and not specifically my novels, but the novel has to do with an investigation of the kinds of embodiments that uh, contradict the idea that you are an island. Mm -hmm. So the novel has to do with those, with that type of embodiment. So I think that, uh, at least in my work, people are always in some kind of a dialogical process, mm -hmm. even if it's only a dialogical process uh, between uh, a person and herself. The idea that you are not alone, that you are not enough, that you need the other, you, ne you need a hand, right. you need someone. The idea that uh, the self gains is its intelligibility through dialogue, and through mutual questioning and through a confrontation with the other. Uh, certainly these ideas, these are ideas that are very important to me and are very important in my books. The not only embodiment, but all the kinds of biological process implicated in being the human being. And the last question I'll have for you today is, Thinking about something that's become quite contentious, and I think we're living through almost a 21st century culture war right now. Um, recently, the author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, she delivered a lecture at the University of Cape Town, which was entitled The Idolatry of Theory in Defense of Storytelling. And one of the things that was quite interesting was a dichotomy that was placed between storytelling and theory your trajectory seems to collapse that uh, dichotomy between storytelling and theory. Can you speak a little bit to that sense and perhaps where we are, where people are pushing back against theory versus lived experience as opposed to seeing that these two inform each other? Yeah, I didn't listen to uh, the words from Shimamanda. Theory is a word that can mean many things, many kinds of theories. So I'm not uh, aware of what she meant. But um, the way I see things is that the philosophy I study at university and the way I was, I learned to read philosophy was a way in which it wasn't just reading. It wasn't just studying or thinking. It was a way of living. 
So it was philosophy as a way of living. Now, as a, a novelist, I see my writing in the same way. I see my writing as my way of living. I don't need anything about surviving or money or... No, I mean the way you live, as the way you conduct yourself in life, as the way you imagine and apprehend yourself as a woman being in the world. So for me, at least for me, reading philosophy wasn't part of some kind of curriculum. It was something deeper than that. In the books I love, I'm looking for ways of making sense of my experience in the world. What a beautiful meditation. Mm -hmm. And I wish we could have a transcript, a written transcript of this, because I think it's such a important way of thinking and synthesizing through an embodied philosophy, a philosophy born out of a life well lived, or at least a life of trying to live well and ethically. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing Jamila read an excerpt from That Hair, which appears in the New Daughters of Africa anthology. From That Hair, my mother put my hair for the first time when I was six months old. The hair, which according to several witnesses and a few photographs, had been soft and straight, was reborn curly and dry. I don't know if this sums up my still short life. One could easily say just the opposite. To this day, along the curve of my nape, it still grows inexplicably straight, the soft hair of a newborn, which I treat as a vestige. The story of my hair begins with this first haircut. How might I write this story so as to avoid the trap of intolerable frivolity. No one would accuse the biography of an arm of being frivolous, and yet it's impossible to tell the story of its fleeting movements, mechanical, irretrievable, lost to oblivion. Perhaps this might sound insensitive to veterans of war or amputees, whose imag imaginations conjure pains they still feel, Rounds of applause runs along the bit. It wouldn't do me much good, I imagine, to fantasize over the reconquest of my head by the soft stranded survivors near the curve of my neck. The truth is that the story of my curly hair intersects with the story of at least two countries and by extension the indirect story of the relations among several continents, a geopolitics. Perhaps the place to begin this biography of my hair is many decades ago in Luanda with a girl named Constanza, a coy blonde, a fetching typist girl perhaps, the unspoken youthful passion of my black grandfather, Castro Pinto, long before he became head nurse at Luanda's hospital, Maria Pia. Or perhaps I ought to begin with the night I surprised him with braids that he found divine. I'd spend nine, nine hours sitting cross-legged on the floor at the hairdresser, head between the legs of two particularly brutal young girls who, in the midst of doing my hair, interrupted their task to turn some feijoada and rice pudding left over from lunch into a bean soup, and I sensed a warmth on my back and a vague odor coming from between their legs. What a sight, he said. Perhaps the story of my hair has its origin in this Constanza, whom I'm not related to in any way, but whose presence my grandfather seemed to seek in my relaxed hair and in the girls on the bus, that after he was already an old man living on the outskirts of Lisbon, would take him each morning to his job at Simov, where his back hunched, he swept the floors until the day he died. But how to tell this history with sobriety and a desirable discretion? Perhaps someone has already written a, a book about hair, Problem Solved, but no one's written the story of my hair, 
and, as I was painfully reminded by two fake blondes to whom I once temporarily surrender my curls for a hopeless brushing, two women, who no less brutal than the others, pulled my hair this way and that, commenting aloud, it's full of split ends, as they waged battle against their own arms, the masculinity of which, with their swollen biceps bulging from beneath their smocks, was the entire time my secret form of revenge for the torture they inflicted. The haunted house that every hair salon represents for the young woman I am is often all I have left of my connection to Africa and the history of the dignity of my ancestors. However, I have plenty of suffering and corrective brushings after returning home from the beauty parlor, as my mother calls it, and of attempts not to take too personally the work of these hairdressers, whose implacability and incompetence I never summon up the courage to confront. The story I can tell is a catalog of salons with Portugal's corresponding history of ethnic transformations of the 50-year-old returnees to the Moldavian manicurists forced to adopt Brazilian methods, undergoing countless treatments to change the natural exuberance of a young lady who, in the words of these same women, is a good girl. The story of surrounding my education in what it meant to be a woman to a public space is not perhaps the fairy tale of miscegenation but a story of reparations. No blonde woman on a city bus ever gave my grandpa Castro the time of day. Humming Bacongo canticles to himself, Papa was the man whom you would never suspect of continuing the time-honored tradition he carries within on our side of the bus. The man of invisible traditions, and what a ring this would have to it capitalized the man of invisible traditions, an original original notion. No one ever looked at him. This man, who by his own account was rather cranky, the Portuguese kid, as he was known as a young man, who was always shouting, Put in the goal, you monkey, referring to black soccer players, and who categorized people according to their resemblance to certain jungle animals, even describing himself as the monkey type, the kind of person who patiently waits for the conversation to come to a close before preferring his wisdom. I come from generations of lunatics, which is perhaps a sign that what takes place inside the heads of my ancestors is more important than what goes around them. The family to whom I hold my hair have described the journey between Portugal and Angola in ships and airplanes over four generations with the nonchalance of frequent flyers, a nonchalance which nonetheless was not passed on to me and froze into stark relief my own dread of trips, a dread that, out of an instinct to cling to life that never sails me on solid ground, I constantly feel will be my last. Legend has it, I stepped off the plane in Portugal at the age of three with my hair in a particularly rebellious state, clinging to a package of Maria crackers. I came dressed in a yellow wool camisole that can still be seen today in an old passport photo, notable for its wide smile, the product of felicitous misunderstanding about the significance of being photographed. I am laughing with joy, or perhaps incited for some comic motive by one of my adult family members, whom I re-encountered tanned and sporting beards in photographs of a newborn me slayed atop of the bed sheets. And meanwhile, it's my hair, and not the mental abyss that day in and day out brings me back to this story. For as long as I can remember, I've woken up with a rebellious mane, so often at odds with my journey, far from the recommended headscarves for covering one's hair while sleeping.
to say that I wake up with the lion's mane out of carelessness is to say that I wake up every day with at least a modicum of embarrassment or a motive to laugh at myself in the mirror, a motive accompanied by impatience and at times rage. It's occurred to me that I might owe the daily reminder of what ties me to my family to the haircut I received at six months of age. I've been told I'm a mulata das pedras, as they say in Angola, not the idealized beauty that mulata conjures for them, but a second-rate one, and with bad hair to boot. This expression always blinds me with the memory of rocks along the beach, slippery, slimy stones, difficult to walk across barefoot. Thank you for your reading. That was really wonderful to hear you and to hear the embodiment of that memory. So thank you. This is a really wonderful conversation. I hope that either I will learn Portuguese soon or mm-hmm. that there'll be translations. No, it will, there will be translations. <laughs> there are, uh, yes. they are confirmed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Because I am very envious of the Lucifer world, you know, for having access to you in the way that they do have. I can't wait for us in the Anglophone world yeah. to have as much access to you and your brilliant mind and your meditations and your reflections are really sorely needed, especially right now in this moment. So thank you so much for your time and spending Thank you so much. and sharing as generously as, as you have. Thank you so much. Subscribe to the new Daughters of Africa podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. On social media, follow at iContinental, at I-K-O-N-T-I-N-E-T-A-L on Twitter and Instagram as well as myself at P-A-N-A-S-H-E underscore C-H-I-G on Twitter and at P-A-N-A-S-H-E C-H-I-G-U-M-A-D-Z-I on Instagram. The New Daughters of Africa podcast is a production of Intercontinental, a non-profit association dedicated to the promotion of African and Afro-diasporic literature based in Berlin, Germany. It's made possible with funding by the Berlin City Center Department for Culture and Europe. Original theme music by Toke. Podcast artwork by Adrian Wilkins. <laughs> <laughs>